About a year ago, uh, we had a similar conference to this, about the fifth slide, so it seemed quite a big of time, uh, in which we essentially kind of collected a group of people in the NHS, and the, the headline of the conference was developing open dialogue in the NHS. And um, the hundred or so people came, all made a commitment to try to go back to our trusts to see if we can develop a kind of transformation project together. And in that short space of a year, we have basically got together four trusts who have organized the training and flown in about 12 trainers from five different countries to help us all learn about open dialogue uh, and assign specific teams in each of our trusts to become pilot teams in order to try to implement open dialogue in our local areas. We're very lucky to have Michelle Berger here with us today, who is the Shadow of Health Minister, uh, and she'll be speaking shortly. Um, we also have had support from the current incumbents at the Department of Health, uh, and I have a quote, Norman Lama's going to come as well, uh, but he can make it, but has sent a quote instead. I'll, I'll start by reading his quote. Um, good mental health care centers around good relationships, relationships between clinicians and service users, and relationships between carers, families, and the communities involved and affected. Open dialogue is a holistic approach to mental health service provision that brings the cultivation of these relationships to the forefront of care. It's a truly person-centered approach with the kind of outcomes that have inspired groups of professionals around the world, from Scandinavia to the United States, to change the way that care is delivered. Pioneering NHS trusts that have joined together to demonstrate its efficacy in the UK context deserve great credit. And if they replicate the kind of outcomes we have seen in other countries, then it will also show that better care from the outset really does cost less in the long run. I therefore applaud all those involved in this trial and wish them every success in their continued endeavours. This is how change comes about. And I thank all of you for starting to make it happen. I've always been particularly supportive in facilitating uh, not only today's conference, but the national training that we now host uh, and the whole kind of project design. I and mean, we've been working with UCL on the academic side of things. So uh, I'm, uh, I have a great debt of gratitude to my trust, and I'm very glad to be able to welcome the chief executive of my trust to be able to uh, start with some opening remarks. So please put your hands together for John Brown. We talk about consumerism, politics, talking about the people that we serve, our community. We talk about models of empowerment. What is open dialogue about? And it truly is about relationships. It's about step change. It's about empowering people and their families and their community. It's a major new work and what we've done around serious mental health problems in history. Open dialogue will create the next generation of revolution for serious mental health problems within this country. And in a year's time, we can come back and look back and see how much of a revolution did we achieve. Good luck. But the facts are the remains that mental health services in our country are often the poor relation within our health services. Too often they don't have the resources they need and too often um, too many patients and families are being let down. We still have got a long way to go um, before patients with mental illness are being treated equally to patients with physical illness or injury. Um, and we do know that unfortunately, despite having parity of esteem in the Act, mental health services have been cut more disproportionately than other services. I'm not going to speak to make too much of a political point, but you will know in this room that that is unfortunately the case. Um, there is nothing more inspiring than to see a, a grassroots movement of everyone in this room coming together to create change. And I'm so, so overwhelmed to see so many people here today. I think this conference really is the epitome of that. Frontline clinicians, doctors, nurses, social workers, occupational therapists coming together with service users and carers to improve the way that we deliver care because you come to it with a strong sense that we can do better than we're doing now. I understand that open dialogue has shown some really, really promising results around the world. It means working with whole families and social networks rather than just individuals alone and also developing the skills to do that. And it means seeing, it means seeing service users and carers as partners, and that's real partners, in the process of change and recovery rather than the more paternalistic top-down models that we have come to see so often. If we can create a system, as Open Dialogue has shown in other countries, 
where the vast majority of mental health service users regain an independent life and leave services altogether within two years, rather than the decades or even the lifetime that ends up being the case for too many people in our country, then you really will have changed that paradigm. And we have, and I, and I hear so much about recovery, but this really is, I think, what recovery is all about. I see this as a major landmark for mental health services in our NHS, and our commitment for what you're, what you're doing is in keeping with my party's commitments to mental health. I hope you know that our position is clear. We want proper integration between physical health, mental health, and social care too, through creating a system that is going to treat the whole patient and the whole person, not just one individual symptom at a time. The NHS is one of our greatest achievements, and indeed our, for our country too. You are here today to take that one step further. Um, I really do thank you for all that you're doing. And um, please say that our best wishes and heartfelt thanks will remain with you for all that you're doing for the duration of this project that you're embarked upon. I hope you have a really successful day. Thank you. And again, we're also a part of a global history. Um, open dialogue is not something that Yalko Saikul and a group of, of clinicians in northern uh, Finland developed out of nothing. It's part of a long history within family systemic therapy, looking at best practices, looking at the research, combining, being eclectic and trying it out, trying and failing and trying and failing, and continual quality improvement. When Yanko says they do what they do, he says, we did it because we asked ourselves, are we doing it good enough? Every day. For years and years and years. That's how Open Dialogue developed. Now a, a European uh, uh, Leonardo project, and Sabina and Carmen, could you stand up? Our two guests from Germany.
The whole logism is about making sure that everybody's voice is heard. So, in a network meeting, now we're doing this training now, where, where kind of, uh, we've had a couple of residential modules, and, and it's very much about learning the skills to draw up those people who are not you know, immediately ready to speak, but being able to form uh, relationships and indicate, even through your body, even through ways of actually being present with somebody, that um, you, know, you are here to hear them, yeah? rather than to tell them or to put a label on them, or to, or to direct them. It's more about actually being here, being present, to hear them. And it therefore means some flexibility and mobility. So because that space has been created, because all the voices are being heard over time, some solutions start to come out that aren't based on a template or a checklist, or certain ideas that the clinicians came in, or kind of a flow chart, but actually they evolve from the space that you've created. And that could be a, a, a range of things. Uh, it could involve medication, as you've seen, as you may have noticed in the previous slide, medication ends up being used less. It does get used, but less because actually facilitating that dialogue, facilitating that delivery seems to have an effect in ameliorating people's uh, risks and anxieties going on. Now these meetings, these network meetings, uh, can last a while, they can last an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. Uh, they're not usually captured at the time, and at the beginning they can be done. Uh, they can be very frequent, because when people are particularly distressed, then you enable, you allow that safety to be created by having that space on a regular basis. Now, the first question that any clinician or manager will ask is, isn't that going to be too expensive? Well, very interestingly, what the ECHOS figures suggest is that you have about 22 meetings, 22 meetings over two years, and over five years you have 27 meetings, which averages out to just over five years. So in reality, if you kind of zoom out and look at it over a kind of wider period, you know, the amount of time you're putting in per person is less. But the initial upfront investment is very high. So it needs a lot of initial upfront support, but that enables people to be able to graduate out of the system and require less and less support in the long term. But it's the dedication, the commitment to start off that way and to keep that, that relationship with them in this particular modality all the way through as long as they need it. And you'll find that by not putting a cap on it that way, and actually it enables people to liberate themselves from services altogether. Now, a little bit of background uh, quickly on the trial we're doing. So we have four trusts. There's my own trust, there's North Essex, there is Kent and Medway, and there's Nottingham. So four trusts, each of our trusts have allocated a team, uh, and each of those teams uh, will be training a certain proportion of that team in open dialogue. And the aim is that sometime next year, we will then uh, start to operate in open dialogue only, in that portion of the team. Just over a year ago, I was invited by a very visionary psychiatrist and a very passionate family therapist to construct a training program for the future. Well, we question, given everything we know, how should we develop a training program? That's a wonderful position to be in. Um, and that's what exactly we've done. We're, we're creating the future. We really believe that. We're not alone here, even though we're sitting in London, we're part of an of a international movement, an international transformation of mental health care, of psychiatry, of mental health care, has to be social. And that's what we're trying to do within the pod project. It's open dialogue based on the best of the best of science and research on what helps. And part of that is value-based practice. It's mindfulness and self-work. It's not a skill you can learn. It's a process you have to live. It's something you have to become, otherwise it doesn't work. It's trauma-informed care, it's recovery-oriented services, it's relational skills, and it's peer support. And by doing so, it incorporates the large majority, if not all, policy initiatives, which we have seen in Norway, which we have seen in England, which we have seen in the United States. The past 10, 15, 20 years it is a natural progression of how to develop mental health care. In Norway, in the manual that's coming out next week, we decided on, on, on three values as being the core values of the open dialogue approach that we practice it in, in Norway. And they are openness, authenticity, and unconditional warmth. Essentially, these values are basic human needs. They're existential challenges that we all have to deal with. And by reflecting on these values, hopefully we become, in a sense, more human. You know what does openness mean? It means being honest with ourselves. It means being open. 
In a clinical sense, it means being transparent. It means walking the talk, nothing about them without them. And it means being a person, no more or no less. It means being able and willing to disclose, to be a person in a clinically benevolent way. It means being a person, not necessarily hiding behind the professional mask of a psychiatrist or a nurse or whatever. It means being weak and strong, confused and unsure, and sad and happy, and sharing those things really late and openly. And to do that, there is this sense of authenticity. Hopefully, we all heard of our uh, Carl Rogers. He said, the more the therapist is himself or herself in the relationship, putting up no professional front to personal facade, the greater is the likelihood the client will change and grow in a constructive manner. We know why being authentic is important. Because trust is important. Because we're not going to trust someone that's not willing to be themselves. And so being authentic and understanding and working with yourself so that you are actually able to be authentic is an important part of the training process. And then there's this wonderful thing called unconditional warmth, unconditional positive regard. Yako and, uh, and David Trimble have written a wonderful article which is worth reading called The Healing Elements of Therapeutic Conversation. Dialogue is the embodiment of love. That very rare and strange thing that we very rarely talk about, love, it has to be there. This unconditional warmth from me to you. Just because you are a fellow human being. And we all aspire to that, I think. That is part of our cultural heritage. Person-centered care is part of the policy. Again, but what does it mean? We spend a lot of time looking at, at uh, person-centered care. And again, it's a sense of trust in the process, a tr trust in the person's ability to feel themselves, if only given the opportunity. It's about trauma-informed care. It's about asking what has happened or how you dealt with it more than what's wrong. It's about understanding that there is a history, that we all have our narratives. That more than being victims, we are survivors of life and should be congratulated for that. You wake up every morning, you look at that page and you say, how do I be more warm today? How do I be more flexible? What does honest in my clinical practice mean? I think shoulder to shoulder, working together, involved everywhere and in everything is the way to go. <coughs> Combining open dialogue with the most recent advances in best practice and research-based mental health care. And that's the wonderful combination. We're basing it on values and on evidence. And it's a, it, it, it is a, a product which is, is, is a continual dynamic process and you become part of it yourself. diagnosis because that attracts money. And that very quickly identifies us as different. You're the one with the problem, I'm the one looking for the problem. It's a very different relationship. When we start to listen to people, then we find it's a different relationship. And if we want to people to talk about their own backgrounds, we have to consider our own. We have to think about what our inner voices are telling us too. Or else they will crop up when we're working with families. When we need to explore these issues about our families, our social networks, it's only us. So why, why work with families? Why work with social networks? The key messages are that involving uh, a family or a partner improves the outcome. Relapse rates uh, in psychosis are more than half. And the well-being of family members is improved. And it reduces care stress and burden. So I guess, uh, hopefully most of us knew this already, apart from 
the fact that families are also the experts. They know the individual far better than we do. They're going to be around a lot longer than we are. The NICE clinical guidelines that were updated last spring, for many years they've talked about involving families uh, at an early stage, but the last update actually mentioned that involving families even when people are not on medication. That was the first time this has been talked about. A step forward, and maybe another 20 years, and that's what catch up with us. I guess for honesty myself, for many years working as a psychiatrist, I've been quite disillusioned with the systems that I work with. Because there's so much supremacy given to diagnosis, treatment, getting into symptoms. And I'm not in a time in my opinion given to thinking about the person's context, their relationships, the meaning behind the symptoms. And so this seemed like um, a good antidote to all of that. It's been a really profound learning experience, it went beyond any other learning experience I've had. And I think that's partly due to the fact that I'm learning alongside such a diverse group of people, really wonderful, passionate people who really believe in this. Uh, people who've got lived experience with mental health issues, people who have families with mental health issues, psychotherapists, nurses, peer support workers, everybody. And we all come with our own experiences, different perspectives. And so it's a really rich learning environment. Because it's a very open environment where we can learn from each other and think about things in new and different ways. And there's a place to be able to do that. So I felt very humbled by the students that I've worked alongside. Mindfulness is, is absolutely key to, to open dialogue. Because not only do we need the space for new ideas, shared language, new understandings to be able to develop within the network, but you need space within your own mind so that you're not tied to your own inner voices and you've got space to find your understandings. What I realised is that often when I'm with a patient, probably before I even get to see them, I'm already thinking about, I wonder what's true of this, and I, I'm trying to sort of make interpretations, what the diagnosis be, what, how am I going to help this person? And there's so much going on inside of my head that I can't be with them, I can't hear them, and I can't validate their experiences. And I can't hear also the wisdom and the knowledge that might come from that group. I'm so busy with what's going on inside my own head. So really the mindfulness for me is, um, well, I think it would be life-changing in terms of how I can now approach being with patients and be alongside their stress instead of just trying to um, stop the symptoms. Um, I've come to realise I was quite ignorant really at mindfulness. Um, I've often recommended mindfulness to my patients thinking it's <coughs> You know, a very positive thing to be, to be doing. And I also thought about it for myself, sort of managing stress, managing anxiety. Wellness is a way of being. Um, and I think Russell in particular has helped me realise that as medics at medical school, we're trained to look for the problem, treat the problem, <coughs> us treating them. And of course, that's not how it is. It's about us as human beings being together. That's really quite a challenge, I think, for, for medical profession, because that's not, at the moment, what our training entails. And so it requires us to have some humility, and it requires us to acknowledge what we don't know. We do have expertise, and this isn't anti-psychiatry by any means. We also need to acknowledge what we don't know and to learn from the network. And this all fit with the direction of travel of mental health services and the NHS in general, because it's compassionate, it the patient and their families at the centre of their healthcare experience. So it seems that now is the time to take on this model. Um, and the experience of the training uh, I joined in January this year has just been incredible. Of course we all work in teams, but we rarely really see clients in teams. And I think this kind of sharing and a shared responsibility and a sharing with um, a social network really inspires me. It was also incredibly non-hierarchical. So suddenly I was sitting across the lunch table with a clinical director who I just didn't know was that until the end of lunch. And I think that's a very nice way to be in uh, our work. And I think that that feeds into the, the sort of ethos of open dialogue, that actually we are equals. 
both us as uh, professionals, but also us and people with in crisis experiencing mental health difficulties. Um, and I think that has to be the way forward. Um, I love the approach. I think it's a, it's a very thoughtful, gentle, considered approach to looking after someone in, in crisis. And for me, um, I was particularly interested because I had an early, an interest in early intervention in psychosis. And so this idea that actually even a very acute psychotic experience can um, be made meaningful. And actually really paying attention to someone's words and, and what is uttered meticulously. And I think it's difficult to understand what open dialogue is until you see it. And seeing Apple Sakula doing it when we were on the course was wonderful. Um, because you get an idea, it is a very careful back and forth process of dialogue that takes place. It's not just a simple dialogue as we know it. It's a really careful kind of process. And I think that appeals to me. Um, I think it, was, it would be great for teams because, as I said, you know, if you're working in a team that trusts one another and you're really cohesive, that's going to lead to better outcomes. There's a lot of research to say that happy teams are going to you know, produce better um, work. Um, and sort of working alongside carers, working alongside peer supporters on the course was a really great experience <laughs> to kind of understand what people were wanting from mental health services. A couple of questions, please, mostly it's a lady from Sam. What's 78% success rate from the model? What's your success rate? <laughs> Is that anywhere we find them statistics? Can we see them statistics anywhere? Because you seem to be dragging the old along. Yes, I suppose. Um, we're so the, the figures from the, um, maybe Russell can add to this, but the figures from uh, Open Dialogue were, I think, primarily about sort of first episode psychosis patients, but it may have included other patients as well. Um, and I think you're right, I mean I'm not sure I can give you a stat off the top of my head, but our success rates, it depends how you quantify success, but certainly we know, and that's why we're standing up here today, that the sort of the medication usage and things like that are, are far higher in our model that we work in at the moment than in the open dialogue uh, model of sort of care. And I guess that's part of why we are trying to think of you know, you, you know, getting involved in an approach where actually we can reduce medication that's used um, and hopefully increase the number of people who kind of suffer a psychotic episode or become unwell in crisis and go on to sort of get back to work and, and are not on benefits. I personally have no doubt that medication was very helpful for some patients um, in, in the state that they were in. So I definitely don't come from an anti-medication view, and I think sometimes medication is extremely helpful. The thing that appeals to me about open dialogue is actually that it's not anti, um, and there is a place for medication. So that although it's very, very sort of carefully thought about, and often, as someone said earlier, medication is not really thought about or considered during at least the first three meetings, and then the discussion may start to happen. So it's a different way, I guess, of thinking about it. I'm still not sure, you know, why that happened, why such a, you just coming together in such a seemingly simple meeting just have such profound outcomes. I suppose, on reflection, one of the, the things that, that, that might sort of be behind that is that when, I, when we're there in the meeting, we're, we're, we're really listening. And I think what I mean by that is that we're not... We don't, we don't come in with an agenda, so as a psychiatrist, I might come in with a, a sort of, I guess, a sort of mental tick, uh, tick list of things to, 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 to look for. And we don't have that, and so we, we're just sort of free to, to hear what's, what's, I guess, really important. And also, um, something which is also, I think, particularly pertinent to, to psychiatrists is that we have this anxiety that we have to do something. I guess we're, we're, we're doing it, we're, we, want to, we want to heal, we want to cure. And actually, in the network meetings, we don't have that. We don't have that pressure, that internal pressure, um, to actually do something ourselves and to sort of um, prove that we're, we're worth our occupation, I suppose. And so, I, I suppose it's kind of liberating. Um, the other thing that happens in the meeting is, is that there's a focus on the, on, on the present moment. And, and, 
And here we come back to, to mindfulness. Um, and because there's that focus on the moment, you know, the meetings are, are creative um, and, they're, and they're real, they're authentic. But what's discussed is what is uh, important and emotionally resonant to the people present there. We're all feeling the hope that perhaps this, this really is um, the start of something big and profound that's going to change things for the better. Hearing all voices is not only important to me on a professional level, it is very important to me on a very personal level as well. The things I like the multi speciality community providers. So when we have our network meetings, one of the things we're looking at is people who are going to be important to that individual and their family are invited to network. That might not be just mental health providers, that might be somebody from the monetary sector, it might be somebody from a, um, a, a vocational advisor, it might, be, it might be a teacher and that. So there might be all sorts of voices that somebody wants in their network meeting. So that multi speciality community providers, that kind of fits in with the model. Um, I think that my GP colleague was talking this morning about integrated primary uh, and, and how, how do we integrate, how do we interface with, with primary care services. Well again, for, for some families, and some families have very, very good relationships with their GP, and that GP might be an important person for, to, to be there in the first instance for that individual, for that family. So they can become part of the network. So I think that's what's what's um, quite beautiful about the model that actually embraces the people that are important to that individual and that family, whether that might be in that, in that point of crisis or, or that journey uh, to recovery. Or we can offer that continuity of care, the less fragmented it will feel for, for us and individuals and families, and, and that's, that's the hope. Um, and the compassion. We know in Kent, when we started working with families, and the compassion is on a, a whole different level when you're actually sitting in the moment with the family, when you're not thinking about, right, what am I formulating, what's the formulation of what's happening here, or what box, like Tom was saying earlier, what box am I needing to tick to make sure I've asked the, rest, the right question. Just authentically being in a space with another person, with a group of people, that's, that's where the communication happens. And it can be very subtle and it may not be very evident until you come to meet them the next time and then you can feel the change. And I know that's been some of the experience of my, of my colleagues. Think about doing something differently which makes people feel anxious and their anxiety sometimes then becomes a sense of, well, there's a risk in it. But actually, if they were listening to themselves, they would understand that that anxiety is coming from within them and not probably the work that we're doing. So that's, that's some of the message we're, we're getting across. And also, how do, we, how do we get other agencies involved? And it is about going out and spreading the message. So it's not just that we're doing the training, that we're developing our work with families. We're going out and sharing the message of what open dialogue is. It's ways we enhance the minds. The open dialogue approach won my heart before it won my mind. And I went to, there was a talk by Jaco, and I went to a weekend with, with, with Val in Leeds, uh, the, the, the Jaco, the, the workshops, completely won my heart on the approach. I then was motivated to go and do more reading, to look more into the research, to look more into the evidence base, and then it won my mind as well. But it won my heart first, and that's, that, that's interesting, because if you think about some of the evidence-based practice and, and, and some of the way we, we evidence the quality of the work we do. It's all about let's see the evidence of our minds first before we allow our hearts to get engaged. So I feel like maybe we can turn that on its head. I think um, the point for me is that it's, it's not just about uh, a debate about medication, it's about that paradigm shift from uh, uh, a disease model to a relational model. And even if you shift to the relational model, at times people still medication, still need medication to help them get by day to day. But if the principle is it's a relational model, then you'll see medication as an aid to supporting somebody um, manage relationally their lives better. Rather than if you stay with a disease model, then you really um, uh, reduce the options to medication. I had not experienced working with a family before as a psychotherapist, I work one-to-one. -one. 
and certainly working with the family in that way uh, made me realise the importance of getting the family involved and the whole network. I went to Woodland and there were eight mental health professionals that sat down in the, in the chair. I looked up and I said, who's the most important person in the room? Uh, I think I replied first. I said, well, who's the most important person in the room? And eventually he pointed to consultant. I said, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> open dialogue can open doors to listening, language and a deeper understanding of what constitutes an expressed emotion or reaction, as opposed to a symptom that may be diagnosed and medicated and thereby conceal the trauma that has created this state of mind or living. By communicating openly, by recognising our own weaknesses first, leads to an ability to empathise with others' vulnerabilities. We may not be able to associate with circumstances or experiences, but we can find a common ground in relation to feeling and thought. Are we a product of happenstance or genetics and environment? The map of unique inherited traces, sequence of events, that by recognising generational influences, future generations can be diverted from behaviours that categorise damaged children. By addressing the path that led them there, whom that ever was metaphorically holding their hand. I hope that philosophy and concept of open dialogue allows freedom of thought and open discussions on issues that are not deemed safe. Yet are our greatest potential crisis, crisis of personal identity. The lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, gender fluid, gender queer community is not a silent voice. It is a supportive community with traditional values that actually begin to make our stereotypical models look a model. As do mixed cultures and mixed race families. These share a common language based on lived experience, mutual understanding and insight into the challenges and rewards that experiences can bring. Space is created that invites the sharing of experiences, focusing on the thoughts and feelings. The shared language develops throughout the dialogue The stories are shared and understood within a given context. Peers have found that by using a different language than the accepted medical language, we have a different conversation which requires a different response. In open dialogue, the language to describe experiences allows for a truly unique perspective. We can begin to explore other ways of finding meaning through hearing other voices and develop to share language together. And I started to question, research and challenge services and thought that mental health provision could be significantly improved. I read about the Open Dialogue Approach in Northern Finland a couple of years ago and felt that this way of working would help our family and many others. Much of it is common sense, but unfortunately it's simply not happening in mental health services in this country. One of the problems is that it is perceived to be happening in continuity, but actually this is an experience that many people don't share. The way the Open Dialogue Approach is delivered is so positive for all concerned. Getting to people straight away is essential. First meeting within 24 hours if required, by offering immediate help, prevents the people becoming even more unwell and may prevent hospital admission. Despite the reduction in inpatient beds, the number of people being sectioned in this country has continued to increase. The impact of being sectioned stays with many people for the rest of their lives and increases stigma. At present, huge amounts of money is spent in providing crisis care. What we need is to turn this around, stop people going into crisis in the first place, and use the money to support people in the community more holistically with the use of crisis housing and keep people within their social networks. 
Many services and many service users disengage from services because they don't find them helpful. Stigma, shame and guilt is a huge issue for many service users and carers and I feel it isn't acknowledged enough by professionals. In Finland, the rate of schizophrenia is declining because fewer people are relaxing, more people are recovering, and this gives a positive message to communities which reduces stigma but also encourages people to seek help even earlier. The open dialogue provides psychological continuity where a small team stay with the person for however long they are needed. This is crucial in developing relationships, trust, openness and allowing dialogue. It's also interesting to note that this way of working also reduces staff emotional burnout in countries that are using this approach. In Open Dialogue, the family or social network is included right from the outset and this is beneficial for everybody. By including siblings, grandparents, families or friends, whoever is important to that person means that all the voices are heard and by carrying this out at a place which is best for the patient and their social network often reduces the stigma and anxiety and also provides a better overall picture of the situation to mental health perfection, professionals which must be helpful in assessing risk. The current medical model that we have at the moment closes down dialogue whereas open dialogue starts right from the beginning to open it up and talk about issues that may be contributing to the problems. Using the network resources to find their own solutions to resolve issues. The outcomes from the open dialogue in Finland are simply staggering compared to anything we're doing in the UK at present. After two years, approximately 74% or higher return to work or study in Finland. In this country, I think we're at about 9%. The difference is simply staggering. And it's about recovery. It's about changing the ethos, the culture of our services. It's about understanding the social context of what recovery entails.